Good morning and welcome back to The Crown, a series where we're moving through the books of First and Second Samuel. And we're trying to do this in a few months' time, so we're kind of taking 30,000 foot views at a few chapters at a time and seeing what different lessons we can kind of pull out from that. We know that if we really wanted to, we could spend a lot more time in these two books, uh, but we're trying to get done before Christmas. And so we're going to kind of take uh, this 30,000 foot view this morning through chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Second Samuel. That's kind of where we left off last week. Pastor Bartley left us off at the beginning of chapter 5, and we're going to pick back up and kind of move all the way through chapter 7 in 2 Samuel. So as we ended up last week in 2 Samuel chapter 5, where we see the elders of the tribes of Israel, they all come together and they recognize David as king. Now this is actually the third time that David is anointed um, as king. If you remember, you know that he was anointed the first time in his youth to become king. Um, He'd become the eventual king, the eventual replacement to the disobedient Saul. Then he was anointed the second time as the actual king, but over Judah. And now this time, he's actually, this third time, he's anointed as king over all of Israel. The tribes come together and they're united. This is when we really start to see a united Israel. You can kind of think of Israel before this as a bunch of tribes that, that made up a confederation. They were united, but they were kind of still just, it was like a confederation. And now that the tribes are actually, all the, the elders are coming together, they're actually recognizing them as their king. We see this united kingdom, this united Israel form. It's a pretty big event. And as we move into these chapters beyond this very beginning of chapter 5, we'll see in 5 and 6 and 7 this major story arc develop. And that's the one of Jerusalem becoming Zion. It's, it's a pretty big deal. Now, Zion can be used to, refu- to refer, uh, excuse me, can re- be used to refer to a few different things in Scripture. Um, kind of a few different uh, locations within one location. Uh, First, the hill where the most ancient area of Jerusalem stood, so Mount Zion within Jerusalem, the city of David or the city of Jerusalem itself, Zion, or the dwelling place of of God, which that is kind of more the more spiritual idea of Zion. So uh, a hill within Jerusalem, Jerusalem itself, or the city of David, and then the dwelling place of God. This is what the concept of Zion is. We can see this in plenty of Psalms. Uh, Zion is mentioned, the Lord's holy mountain in Psalm 2.6, uh, uh, the place where the Lord is enthroned, Psalm 9.11, and from which David yearns of salvation to emerge, Psalm 9.14. In his vision of end times, the apostle John, we, we see Saul, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's in Revelation chapter 14. Now, we're not going to take the time to get into that verse and break down Revelation 14, but uh, that's, that's a different sermon. But it's to say that the concept of Zion is a pretty significant one in the Scriptures. And we're about to see this small Canaanite city, which is Jerusalem, become the city of David, become Zion. So 2 Samuel chapter 5 verses 6 through 10 is kind of where we jump into and it's, it's where we see David capture the city of Jerusalem and he makes it his capital city. So verse 6, the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Now, Up to this time, Jerusalem was a small Canaanite city in the center of Israel. Basically, Jebusites equaled Canaanites, to make a a long story short. And this is hundreds and hundreds of years after God commanded Israel to take all of the land, the whole land in which this city stood. And this city was still in Canaanite hands. Remember how Pastor Bartley said your your disobedience can catch up to you last week? (laughs) David wouldn't have even had to deal with these people. He wouldn't have had to to siege this city and and take it for Israel if Israel would have just obeyed in the first place. 
We also see this, the people of the city act a little prideful in this statement. So the Jebusites, because the city of, of um, Jerusalem was a well-guarded city, because of its location, the way it stood, it was actually easily defended. And so you can see a little bit of pride come out in these people, not thinking, hey, this, this Israel army can't do anything to us. They're a little bit overconfident, and they actually mock David a little bit here, mock him and his army. And in uh, verse 7, we pick it up, Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. On that day, David had said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those, lame and blind, who are David's enemies. That is why they say the, the blind and lame will not enter the palace. So despite how well the city was de de defended, we see that David and his army, well, they're successful and they conquer the city, they take it, they overthrow. And a side note, uh, since the, the water shaft is mentioned here in this passage, some think that David sent his men through what is called the uh, Warren's shaft. And this was a narrow vertical shaft, which is a sloping tunnel that enabled the Jebusites to haul water up from the Gihon Spring. So how they actually got water into the fortress was they had this kind of narrow secret tunnel that led them down to where they could draw water from the spring. And then David's army kind of took the defenders by surprise by climbing up this shaft and overthrowing them. So whatever exactly their tactics were, David and his men persisted through difficult circumstances to defeat an overconfident enemy. As the story goes on, we see David and the city, wait for it, the, become the city of David. <laughs> and it basically says that, that he builds out the city. So the, he conquers the city and then he names it the, the city of David and then he builds it out. He makes it a bigger, greater city. And David becomes more and more powerful because the Lord was with him. The lesson that we can pull from this first section is simply this. Always have the confidence to be persistent and the wisdom to not be proud because the Lord is with you. Always be confident. Always have confidence to be persistent and the wisdom to not be proud because the Lord is with you. This is how we're called to live as Christians with this contrast between confidence and humility. And as humans, we can get this wrong because confidence can become arrogance and we can become proud and we can try to do things on our own. And, and then humility, we can, we can have false humility and we can uh, not actually have confidence that we can actually do things in the Lord. But this is how we're called to live with this contrast as Christians, holding humility and confidence together. And the only way we can actually walk this line is by relying on the Lord, by submitting ourselves in obedience to Him, knowing that He is with us, knowing who He is and what He can do, not what we can do, but who He is and what He can do. Any kind of greatness we have or achieve is not from us, it's from Him. And David do, knew this, even though he, him and his army were able to conquer the city and, and, and rename it, and they, 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 they build out the city and make it great, David knows this is because of the Lord. If we jump to verse 12, then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over, over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. David knew that, that God did this. And God didn't even do it for him first, he did it for other people. It's not about David, it's about God. And then before it even gets to being about David, it's about his people, it's about God's people as a whole. <clears throat> for the sake of his people, it says. Knowing this truth helps us live this out. If we actually know that, that, that the things that God wants to do through us aren't for us or because of us a lot of the time. Well, they're never because of us. And a lot of times they're not necessarily for us to begin with. They're, they're to honor God. They're to bring him glory. And then they're to bless other people. It's for his people. It's for his purpose. Helps us live out this truth of having confidence of what God can do and also holding the humility to be able to understand that it's God doing it. So as we move on in the story, we have 2 Samuel, um, we're, we're moving on in chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. We see David's many wives, which is kind of a no-no. 
As we move on in the chapter, we see that David took on more wives and had more children. And some could see this as a blessing because more children uh, was a pretty big blessing. It's, it's still a blessing now, but back then, uh, just because of uh, health and the, the rate of, of death and childbirth, having children, having more children for your line to go on, this is, a, this is a huge blessing. So some people could see this as a blessing. But if we actually kind of look at Deuteronomy 17.17, 17, we, we learn that this is a no-no. This is, not, this is not what David's supposed to be doing. None of us are without sin. Not even the guy, David here, who is dubbed, uh, remember, the, the, the guy after God's own heart. So even here, and later on, we'll see major sin develop in David's life and, as we go on in the story. But even here, we see this guy who conquered Goliath, and he's, you know, he was the next great king, and then he's made king, and this guy, even he is without sin. The guy dubbed after God's own heart. This was a time of, of pretty good success for David. No, in the, in the first part of 2 Samuel, so if you break down like the book of 2 Samuel in big chunks, you have the first half is kind of about David and his successes, and then the second half of 2 Samuel, which we'll see, is all about his troubles. So in, right here, we're right smack dab in the middle of David's success. This is a pretty big time for him. So right now, we're in the middle of David's success, and, and we see him make some choices that are in disobedience. Again, this should remind us of the point that Pastor Bartley made last week, that our, disobe that our disobedience can follow us when we don't take care of it. We will find a lot of the trouble and the drama that David finds himself, on, finds himself in in the future is caused by some of his disobedience even during his success. A commentator puts it like this. It is often true that the seeds to our future trouble are sown in times of great success and prosperity. In some ways, David handled trials better than successes. <clears throat> See, this can be true for us. When, when, when times are hard, sometimes, you know, for some of us, we, we question God and we kind of get angry, but a lot of us actually are driven towards God. Because times are hard, we actually want to cling to him. We, all we know is, is that he is our hope when things aren't going well. But when things are going good, we tend to back off in our relationship with God. This is a lesson that we can see. See, another lesson for us is don't get complacent when things seem like they are going well. Don't get complacent when things seem like they're going well. When things are actually going well, or at least when there's not a lot of drama happening in our life, it's not the time to back away from God. It's the time to actually push harder into him to actually push into our relationship with God, to actually develop a deeper relationship with him, to actually be aware of how we're obeying him so that we're not setting up disobedience that's going to come back to bite us in the future. As we keep going in chapter 5, we get to verses 17 through 25, and we see David defeats an old foe, and he does it a couple times. <laughs> When the Philistines, it says, heard about David becoming king and his success, they weren't having any of it. Uh, they, they didn't want this to happen. They didn't like David. And so they basically launched uh, an attack against David and the Israelites. They launched an attack against Israel, and we see David and his army defeat the Philistines a couple times in different battles as we move through this chapter. Verses 17, it says this, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. Now, obviously, we see the principle of seeking the Lord for wisdom and direction in this passage, right? Uh, David, he, he goes and he seeks the Lord before he kind of moves out against the Philistines. But there's something else here that kind of sticks out that we should pay attention to. And it's when it says, but David heard about it and it went down to the stronghold. Because David knew his surroundings, he was actually, uh, this kind of gives us a clue that, that he knew uh, he knew his surroundings, and so he knew how to make a strategic action. So he, he seeks the Lord, 
and then he's aware of his surroundings and he makes a strategic action based off of it. Because David knew his surroundings from, and from other clues in the text um, and in, in other things from First Chronicles, the stronghold that it talks about here probably wasn't the stronghold, the stronghold or, or the citadel in, within Jerusalem. It was probably a stronghold that was out, out in, the, uh, in the valley, away from Jerusalem, that was in a place that actually guarded Jerusalem, uh, kind of a first line of defense for Jerusalem. Most likely because David wished to drive the Philistines back and prevent them from plundering his, his country, he, he would have marched down with his for, forces to his old post at Adullam. So a place where David actually already resided and worked out of. This place was a strong position in the Valley of Elah and one of the most likely routes for an invading army to take. Right, so it's an outpost, it's a stronghold that was actually a defense against any kind of invading army to come. And so when David's talking about this, because of different things that we can find in the text, it seems like because he was so aware of his surroundings, right, he sought the Lord, he was aware of his surroundings, he actually is able to then to make this strategic action to go out against the Philistines. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this, this is pretty big because this likely saves a lot of lives, and sets up Israel to save Israel, or to, to, to save Jerusalem from the attack of the Philistines. You see, because David knew his surroundings, he was able to take a very strategic action as he followed the Lord into battle. So this brings up a lesson for us that simply we need to be aware of our surroundings. As we seek the Lord for guidance and wisdom, it is our part to be faithful and to be aware of our surroundings. And we're not in a, in a battle against the Philistines, but we are in a spiritual battle. And we need to be aware of our surroundings in the things that God has called us to do. Things like uh, we need to know our family. We need to know the makeup of our children and our wives and what's happening in their lives. <laughs> we need to know our surroundings. We need to know the surroundings in our communities. We're called to be on mission. We're called to make disciples that make disciples. We're called to, to fulfill the, the great commission and to, 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 to fulfill the great commandment, to love God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul. And to make disciples that make disciples, to love our neighbors at our, as ourselves. And the only way we do this well is if we are seeking the Lord first for direction, but also if we're faithful and we know our surroundings so we can move and operate within that mission and be faithful to what God has called us to do. So know our surroundings. Know what's happening in the life of your family. Know what's happening in the life of your community. And also know that this is a spiritual battle. We have to be aware of that. As we keep moving, then we, we finish up chapter 5 and we move into chapter 6. And in verses 1 through 15, we see a failed and a successful attempt at bringing the ark of God to Jerusalem. And this keeps developing this idea of, of Jerusalem being Zion. This chapter starts off with, and we see David assemble his best men, his, um, and, and a lot of them, because this mission was that important. Bringing the ark to Jerusalem was an important step towards providing a central place of worship for all of Israel. This was important to David. The Ark of God represented the immediate presence and glory of God in Israel. And bringing it to Jerusalem helped Jerusalem establish itself more as Zion. And just in case you missed it, when we talked about the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, um, a little, some details about it. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which God commanded Moses to make some 400 years before David's time, it was a wood box. The ark actually means bach or, or chest, completely covered with gold, with, a, with an ornate gold lid or, or top known as the mercy seat on top of it. The ark of God was around three feet, nine inches long, two feet, three inches wide, and two feet, three inches high. In it were the tablets of the law of Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that miraculously budded as the confirmation of his leadership. The Ark of the Covenant. See, David wanted to bring the Ark out of the obscurity, which it had been 
for a while at this point and put it in its rightful place, so to speak. Now, as the story goes on, we know that the first attempt fails because the Israelites don't follow God's instructions on how to actually move and handle the ark. We see they they move it on a cart, and this was against God's instructions that we can find earlier. And then some some Nimrod actually touches it, um, which we know is also not what you're not supposed to do from the book of Numbers. We can see that. You're not supposed to touch the, uh, the ark. You're not supposed to move it on a cart. You're supposed to carry it a certain way. And this poor guy, Uzzah, the guy that, that touched the ark, God strikes him down dead because he touches it and he's disobedient in God's instructions. And then we see David get angry and confused and he leaves the ark <clears throat> at some Levite's house. A lesson we can learn from this is, hey, do what you know God says is right. Don't do what you think is right. It's a pretty big one. Do what you know God says is right. Don't do what you think is right. And oftentimes we're caught doing this. Oftentimes we take things into our own hands. We let our preferences and what we think is better, right? Like, hey, let's move the ark on a a cart. Seems like it'll be easier. Let's do it. We can do like things like that in our life. Our thoughts and, and what we think is right and, and, and wrong lead our decision-making. Like we let our own justice-making, what we say is right and what we say is wrong. But that doesn't matter. All that matters is what God says is right and what God says is wrong. Uzzah made a decision in a moment to disregard God's command and do what seemed right to him. Even decisions made in a moment matter to God. We have to stop treating instructions from God like they're suggestions. Right? Sometimes we treat God the way that my children treat me. Right? Like, hey, go cl- clean your room. Are you sure you want me to clean your room? <laughs> clean my room? We have to stop treating God like we're immature children <laughs> and that his instructions are just suggestions. You need to do what God says is right, not what we think is right. On the flip side, the, the brighter side, we see, God do a good, we, we see God do good and bring blessing even in the midst of disobedience here. Like we see God act time and time again with his people. When his people are unfaithful, God is always faithful. He always shows up because he's a good God. The ark ends up in the hands of people it was supposed to be in anyhow, the Levites. Obed-Edom, the, the Levite uh, here mentioned here, was a Levite of the family of Koth. And we can see that in First Chron- Chronicles chapter 26. This was the family within the tribe of Levi, Levi that God commanded to carry and take care of the ark anyhow. We see that in Numbers chapter 4. Because of this blessing, David eventually gets over. So, so there's disobedience happen. God acts. David gets a little angry, but then the ark gets left where God kind of wanted it to get left anyhow. And then some time goes on. And because of this blessing, because David can, can see that God's working and he's blessing, David gets over his anger. He gets over his fear. He gets over his confusion. And eventually then he decides, okay, well now it's time to actually bring the ark to Jerusalem And so we see the second attempt and successful attempt at bringing the ark to Jerusalem. After this, we see this this closeout in the chapter, uh, verses 16 through uh, through 23. We see this big celebration happen um, where where the Lord is worshipped through burnt and peace offerings. We see then David's daughter kind of uh, give him a hard time by thinking that he's being undignified the way that David's acting. And David basically rebukes her and says, hey, guess what? It's not for you. It's for God. So get off my back. And then we move to chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. We see David offers a house and God says no, or at least not yet. Because of everything God had done for David and Israel, David is overcome with emotion. We see this at the beginning of of chapter 7, and and he feels bad that the ark is hanging out in a tent, basically, and he's in this nice, pristine house. And and so then he offers to build uh, a house for God, basically the temple. But God says, nope, 
And, and later on, we learn that, that one of David's descendants is actually supposed to build this house, the temple. But right now, it's not David's place and time to do this. In verse 4, it's, we can pick up the story here. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God here is basically saying, thanks, but no thanks. I, I never commanded you to do this, so how, how about we actually get back to what I'm commanding you to do? It's not that this is bad, it's not that it's wrong. God kind of, you, you kind of see God actually kind of honor David even in his no, even in his response. But it's not your time. And again, we, we learn later on a house, the temple is built, but it's built by Solomon. It's built by David's descendant. It's not what God wanted David to do at the time. Now, this begs the question, what do we do when God says no? What do we do, or, or how do we respond when God says no? God will often use these times when he says no to us to shape our hearts, to move us in a certain direction, and we need to be paying attention to it. And the way we respond can be a marker on our lives. How we respond to God when he says no, even if it's a good thing we want to do. No matter what it is, the way we respond, we can look back and it can actually be a marker on our life. We can say, oh man, the way I responded kind of sent me this way or sent me that way. It's a big deal. And God uses his answers of no to shape our heart. It's okay to grieve if, if the situation calls for grieving. It's okay to be disappointed if it's something that you should be disappointed about. But we need to allow the no to drive us closer to God, not to drive us farther away from God. Because God is good, and his answer of no, even if it's something we don't like or even if we don't understand because we're trying to do something good for God, his answer of no is always better. God always has something better. From 1 Chronicles 29, we can see how David respond, responded. He gathered all the material and gave generously to the cause of building the temple, even though he wasn't the one that was actually going to build it. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't just kind of wallow in, hey, well, I wanted to do this for you, God, but you said no. He responds in, in, in faith and, and he takes action. And he gives generously to something that he's not even going to see happen. You see, the way we respond to no reveals if our heart is consumed by us or if it's consumed by God and his ways. It can be a telling thing. And sometimes I think God tells us no to reveal what's in our heart. Is our heart consumed by us? Or is it actually consumed by God and his ways? Or will we give generously to something even if we're not a part of it? <laughs> right? That's an example from David. So as we keep moving in, in chapter 7, we get to verses 10 through 17. And we see that God promises a better legacy. So God says no. But on the flip side, he actually promises something better. Right? God, God even though in God's no, he always has something better. Something that is far more good than what we could imagine, even if it doesn't feel good or we don't understand at the time. So God promises a better legacy. We see that God doesn't just say no. He always has a reason and purpose. So if you, if you read with me, uh, verse 10, it says this, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And have done ever since that time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offerings to succeed you, 
your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him in a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. We see here that God promises a couple different things. First, he promises to establish a secure Israel. Again, this runs with the theme that, that yes, David is blessed here <clears throat> and he's used, but it's not about David. It's about something bigger. It's about God and his people. It's about God's greater plan. So he, he establishes this promise first. It's about God and his people. But then secondly, God promises to build David a house, but a different kind of house. God says no to a house at this time, but then he promises a household. This is a different kind of house, not a building, but a household, not bricks and mortar, but relationships and continuity. David, you will have a different kind of legacy. Yours will not be tangible, basically is saying, the concrete or the monumental, but but yours will be a legacy of family that knows the presence of their creator. This is the promise that God is giving David. We know that this promise, this blessing, that is that God, God will use David's line to bring about Jesus eventually. Pretty big. This is a different kind of legacy. Not a house made with hands, but a house built by the Spirit and shaped in human hearts. It's a different kind of house. It's a better legacy. You see, if if you're a Christ follower and you're a part of his church, his bride, you and I, like King David, are called to build a legacy that is spiritual, a legacy that is family. The world may think of success as the accumulation of wealth and power or fame, but you and I, we know that success is different, or at least we're supposed to know that success is different. As people of God, uh, we're called to understand a different kind of legacy, the kind that that will persist and last for eternity, the kind of legacy uh, of love, a, a spiritual legacy. See, the lesson here is that our legacy is to be defined by him and his mission, not by our bank accounts and our careers. Our legacy, the things that we're supposed to be about building, are supposed to be for him and within his mission. They're not supposed to be for us and for us to leave some some temporal material stuff. Something far better, far greater. And as we close, we see the rest of this chapter close out with a prayer of thanksgiving in a prayer asking God to fulfill his promises that he just made. And the only way we realize the truth that God wants us to, to, to use us to build a different kind of legacy is if we approach him with this heart that we see David approach at the end of chapter 7. We approach him with humility and with a spirit of thankfulness for who he is and what he's done, what he's promised. <clears throat> See, this creates a proper spiritual posture for us to approach God and to actually work within what he's called us to do. Part of that posture is also repeating back to God what he's promised, which we see David do here at the end of the chapter. He has this this spirit of thankfulness, and then he, he basically prays back. He says, God, you know, do what you promise. And it's not that God isn't going to be faithful. God is always faithful. But David, this practice actually helps David be faithful in return to God. See, God can call us to make disciples to make disciples, but if we actually don't step into it, he's going he's gonna to do his plan no matter what, but we're not actually going to get to experience or be a part of it. God promises David a better legacy. 
And then David responds with the spirit of thankfulness and humility to step into it. So guys, as you go about your week this week, what's the legacy you've been building? Is it something that's eternal, that's spiritual? Has it been a part of God's greater plan and purpose? Or has it been just temporal? Has it been something that's about you or just about your family? You're, you're kind of like family unit, not about God's overall spiritual family. What legacy have you been building? Because God calls us to something better. Thanks for being with us.